Huge thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. More about them later. Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism are used to describe how electric and magnetic fields behave in our universe. But did you know that there are at least two ways in which each of these can be written? After all, there are two sides to every story. Hey there, my name's Path, and in this video we'll be looking at why every Maxwell equation can be written in two different ways, and what each one of them actually means. So if you enjoy this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit the bell button for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Let's begin by recalling that Maxwell's equations describe how electric and magnetic fields behave in our universe. Electric fields are generated by charged objects, and we use these fields to describe what happens to other charged objects placed in the region of space where the field exists. The simplest example of this is looking at a couple of charged particles. Let's say we have a charged particle initially at this point in space, and it's positively charged. We can draw what its electric field looks like. It looks a bit like this. What these arrows, or electric field lines, represent is the force that our source charge will exert on another small charged particle placed within the field. For example, say we had a second small positively charged particle and we took it and placed it here. Well then, this particle will experience an electric force in this direction due to the source positive charge. The electric field lines show the direction and the size of the force that the small charge will experience at different points in space. And this makes sense because we know that positively charged objects repel each other. They have the same charge, so they repel. If instead our source charge was negative, then the field would look like this. And so the little charge would experience a force that attracts it towards the negative source charge. This again makes sense because opposite charges attract each other. Now that is a basic description of electric fields. Magnetic fields behave in a somewhat similar way, but show the effect of magnetic forces. Once again, opposites attract, but this time it's magnetic poles rather than electric charges. And like poles repel each other. Now, if you want a more detailed discussion of what electric and magnetic fields represent, as well as how we deal with them mathematically, then check out this video I made on my channel a little while ago. It's also linked in the description box below. The important thing here is that Maxwell's equations describe exactly how these electric and magnetic fields come about, as well as how they can behave. For example, how could we work out what an electric field looks like if we didn't have any experiment we could do to work it out? How could we calculate it purely theoretically? Well, we could use Maxwell's equations, which seem to mathematically encode how electric and magnetic fields appear to behave in our universe, at least. Hey, so let me take a moment to tell you about the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. Imagine you're a curious and hardworking chemistry student at university. You love everything about the subject and you just want to learn more. Organic, inorganic, you don't care. But at some point during your studies, you hear this forbidden word. Physics. 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 You're hearing it pop up more and more often, and you want to find out what it means. But of course, you can't, because your university administrators are keeping a close eye on your search data. After all, they provide your internet service, and they don't want anybody, especially chemistry students, to find out about the true beauty of this forbidden subject. Well, guess what? With NordVPN, you can learn all about physics to your heart's content whilst keeping your data secret from your university that otherwise has tabs on all the interneting that goes on in their premises. On top of that, you can also access all the textbooks and research papers that have been region locked because your government has decided that physics is too good for the general public. Luckily, the country next door, Physicsland, has all of this content available freely. So NordVPN lets you see it all. And while you're at it, you can watch shows on Netflix and Disney Plus that aren't available in your country as well. Included with Nord is CyberSec, which will filter out malicious traffic and stop web pages from loading stuff that may actually damage your computer. So it gives you an additional layer of protection and peace of mind. So if you want to check out Nord with their 5400 plus servers in 60 countries, up to six simultaneous connections, 
and double data encryption for increased anonymity. Then head over to nordvpn.com forward slash pathg and use the code pathg for an exclusive deal. It's risk-free due to their 30 day money back guarantee. Thank you once again to Nord for sponsoring this video and allowing chemistry students to see the light. Let's take a look at one of these equations. This equation here tells us something relatively basic, but yet quite important and profound. It looks at what is known as the divergence of any magnetic field that can exist in our universe. This downward pointing triangle, the nabla, followed by this dot, represent this thing known as divergence. So what does divergence mean? Well, let's take some simple magnetic fields that look like this, and then try and understand how a magnetic field such as this behaves when passing through some randomly chosen volume of space. Let's say this randomly chosen volume. For simplicity, we're making it a cube. The divergence of the magnetic field for this particular volume is simply the amount of magnetic field passing out of the volume minus the amount of field passing into the volume. In other words, divergence measures the net amount of field being transferred either into or out of our chosen volume. And Maxwell's equation tells us that this difference between the field in and field out, this divergence of the field, must always be zero. The amount of field passing in must always be equal to the amount of field passing out in order for our chosen magnetic field to be allowed to exist in our universe, assuming Maxwell's equations are correct, of course. And although we chose a simple looking magnetic field and a simple volume, we could, in theory, choose any real magnetic field and any closed volume, and this equation should still hold true. Now, as we saw earlier, magnetic fields seem to come from the north pole of a magnet and end on a south pole. However, this equation is telling us that this cannot be entirely accurate. If we put a volume around our North Pole, for example, then we have more field leaving than we do going into our volume. But in reality, there actually exists a magnetic field within the magnet as well. And hence, the amount going in equals the amount leaving. Now, in this diagram, it looks like there is more field leaving than there is going in. But remember, the field is stronger in the magnet so if we account for the strength of the field, the total amount of field going in equals the amount of field going out. I'm using some slightly loose terminology here, but for our purposes, it'll do. I've made a whole video discussing just this equation, including why this means that cutting a magnet in half always creates two new magnets rather than a separate North Pole and a South Pole. Check out that video linked up here or in the description box below if you're interested. And I've also got a video discussing this downward pointing triangle or nabla in greater detail. Again, linked up here or in the description if you'd like to watch that. But here's the interesting thing. Did you know that this equation, or at least this same idea that this equation is trying to represent, can be written from a slightly different perspective? It looks a bit like this. Looks a bit more complicated with more symbols that we may or may not know the meanings of, but essentially it discusses the same principle. Let's look at what it's telling us. Once again, we see the magnetic field described by this equation. But this time, we also see this term here, ds. Remember our volume that we were looking at earlier? Well, ds just represents a small piece of the outer area around our volume. The d tells us that it's a very small piece, infinitesimally small, in fact. And the s just stands for surface. So what we're doing here is breaking up the outer surface of our volume into lots of small pieces and then calculating how much magnetic field passes through each of these small pieces. Then we add up all of these contributions to once again find the net magnetic field passing in or out of the surface. That's what this integral sign tells us. It tells us to add up all the little components. But while earlier we studied how the magnetic field interacted with the volume, considering the divergence, in this case we're looking at how it behaves across the surface enclosing the volume. Potato, potato, basically the same thing, but from a slightly different perspective. This symbol here, by the way, the circle or the rounded closed off thing, signifies that the surface we are considering must be completely closed. No little holes or openings, otherwise this equation won't apply. A clearer example showing the difference between the two approaches that we've seen here can be seen when we consider another Maxwell equation. This time we want to consider one that deals with the electric field. 
the electric field is slightly different to the magnetic field in that the net amount of field going in to any volume doesn't always have to be zero. It is usually zero, except when we have some charged objects within our volume. In that case, if the overall charge is positive, then there is more field flowing out than flowing in, and vice versa. Charges are sources and sinks of the electric field. Now, if we consider this volume, which encloses a single positive charge, then we can see that this version of the Maxwell equation looks at this scenario from the perspective of the volume itself and what is contained within it. The charge, which in this case is a source of the electric field, results in a net outward flow of electric field from this volume. This outward flow, given by divergence, is equal to the density of the charge, or how much charge there is per unit volume of space we're considering, divided by this constant that for our purposes doesn't really matter that much. It's the permittivity of free space. And if we look at the other version, the integral version, we see that this equation looks at our scenario from the perspective of the surface around our volume and how much field crosses it in total, which must equal just the charge enclosed by the surface divided by this epsilon naught again. So both equations are functionally identical as they describe the same scenario, but they do so in very subtly different ways. And that's what is interesting. Every Maxwell equation has a differential version and an integral version and converting between them involves understanding differential calculus, but it's not super difficult to do once you know the maths. In other words, if you know one version, you could, in principle, derive the other. And in this video, we've looked at what are, in my opinion, the two more intuitive equations when it comes to looking at the difference between the two versions of each of these equations. So with all of that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit that bell for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked down below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's linked down below in the description if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.